Hello and welcome to Basildon Park, set in the heart of the Thames Valley and just a couple of miles down the road from my hometown of Reading. Some of you will recognise the building behind me. Some of you might find it relatively familiar if you've seen the uh, latest movie version of Pride and Prejudice with Kira Knightley, or maybe you've seen The Duchess, or maybe even you've seen it in one or two television commercials. However, there's an awful lot of history with Basildon Park and some interesting stories behind that history. Lord and Lady Eyliff were the last main residents of this property, but there's been a number of occupants over the years, and we'll find out more about those later. But for now, I really want to get a sense of the history of this property and find out more about the rooms inside. Luckily, I do have a man in the know who can help me out about this. He's from the National Trust, one of the volunteers, Nick Risdale-Smith. He knows an awful lot about this property, and hopefully he'll come down and uh, tell us a little bit more about it. I wonder where he is. I have seen him around. Actually, I think he's coming now. So, hello, Nick. Hello, Andrew. Welcome to Basildon Park. Good to see you. Good to see you. Now, the thing about this property is, it's huge. I don't even know where to begin. Which room do you recommend? Where well, do we start? But why don't we go in through the main entrance, which means climbing the stairs and go behind these columns here. OK, well, lead on. I can't help noticing, Nick, that we're actually going a floor above ground. Is, is there a reason for why the main entrance is here? Well, this is where the main the guests were welcomed, the important guests. Uh -huh. But in Italy, these Italianate-style houses are so designed that when in July and August, when it's very hot, uh, as the door opens, there's a nice cooling breeze that goes around the main rooms that are used for entertaining. So let's go in and have a look. Absolutely. Wow. A beautiful ceiling. Absolutely wonderful. The plaster work in this hallway is particularly fine, uh, but it hasn't always been like this. During the war, when the house was uh, requisitioned by the military as a, an officer's mess, this room was actually divided into two with a, a dividing corridor. And when the Islers came to view the property in 1952, although the plaster work itself had not suffered too much, there was a lot of graffiti on the walls and it needed painting. But the only damage to the actual plaster work was done actually in the corner of the ceiling just up there. Um, one of the panels there had to be uh, remoulded when the Islers were restoring the property. And you see it's, uh, well, it's very difficult to see where it was because it's uh, such a fine bit of repair work. It's seamless, isn't it? So the Islers painted this, uh, the walls to reflect what we, they believed the ceiling would have been like in Francis Sykes's day. I see. Well, one of the first things that strikes me as soon as I came in was the, uh, the, the image of the two griffins here. I, is that symbolic in Well, some it way? is very symbolic because you'll see in the plasterwork there are other examples of the griffins. Uh, this is a link between this house and India. Francis Sykes, who built the property between 1776 and 1783, made his money in India in the East India Company. And uh, this is, uh, in myth Indian mythology, griffins are supposed to guard the country's treasure. So it is a nice uh, way of linking his, uh, his past with India. The flask work itself was by John Carr, who was the architect, uh, after the style of the Adam brothers. But let's go and look at another room, where, at another artist associated with the house. Wow, it's a beautifully intricate door here as well, isn't it? We have some lovely doors on, particularly on this floor. This is solid Spanish mahogany with the original furniture dated 1783. But when the Islas came here, the place was empty. There were no doors hanging at all. All the doors on this floor, which were found in a heap in the boiler room, which I think is rather sacrilegious when you consider what beautiful doors they are. Uh, but it is a most beautiful door, isn't it? So let's go into the Graham Sutherland room. Right. Wow. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah. These drawings are by Graham Sutherland, hence the reason why I call it the Graham Sutherland Room. They are working drawings which weavers used to create a large tapestry designed by Graham Sutherland which hangs in Coventry Cathedral. It's behind the high altar. It's the largest tapestry in Europe, measuring some 74 feet by 34 feet, entitled Christ in Glory. The late Lord Iliff, who was a great friend of Graham Sutherland's, bought the entire collection from him and donated them to the Herbert Gallery in Coventry, who've loaned us these 45, I hope, on a permanent basis. They've been here for a number of years, so I guess it probably is.
So here we are in the green drawing room. Wow, this is magnificent. Look at that ceiling. It is a very fine ceiling. It is original in, in every particular. Nothing has been done to it by way of cleaning or renovation since the house was finished in 1783. But it did acquire a stain just above us here. Lady Isle have told us that when she was here in 1952, a badly plumbed in washing machine in the room above <laughs> caused the stain. Wonderful. And again, another room with magnificent paintings. But, but this one in particular, Nick. This is by Sebastiano Galeotti, painted, we think, about 1709. Uh, the painting actually tells us the biblical story of Rebecca at the well. Underneath it, we have a sofa known as a confidant sofa. It is one of a pair. The other one, we believe, is at Clarence House, uh, belonging, of course, to Prince Charles. And the lovely walls in this room, Nick, but I can't help noticing they're a little bit different to the other room. Why is that? Well, they're actually silk. It's Edwardian damask silk. We believe that in, in the time Francis Sykes built this property, this was his morning room, breakfast room, that they would have been hung with silk uh, drapes on the walls. Um, so these were obtained from Englefield Park uh, about 1979 by the National Trust. They originally curtains, curiously, and one can see on the walls how the stripes have, 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 been, have been created by the light when they were curtains and the folds of the curtains, you can imagine. So it suits the room well, which is why we call it, of course, the green drawing room. <laughs> Remarkable. So, Nick, where next? Well, let's go to the Octagon Drawing Room. OK. OK, now I am impressed. Now, if I were an estate agent, I'd probably call this the selling point of the house. It's a remarkable room, isn't it? Well, it was one of the selling points which influenced the Honourable James Morrison and he bought the property from uh, the Sykes family in 1838. He employed an architect by the name of J.B. Patworth to complete the decorations, and this ceiling, which is Victorian, is of his creation. It's, uh, the room itself was uh, particularly favoured by Morrison because he was, if you like, the rich and Branson of his age. <laughs> And he had a great, a fine collection of paintings, and he felt this room would be a, an ideal uh, gallery to show them off. His paintings included uh, works by Turner, by Constable, by Hogarth, by Leonardo, a very comprehensive collection. Beautiful pictures hanging up in the moment, especially this rather epic looking piece here, which is this one. This is one by Giovanni Petoni, uh, again, late 17th century. It is of Mars and Venus. If we look to that wall there, we have for two of the paintings by Batoni. The painting on the right is of God the Father. The one the other side of the door is of St. Paul. If we look towards this side here, the far painting there is St. Peter with the key. Wonderful paintings here. And also, I can't help noticing a pretty magnificent looking piano as well. Very interesting piano. It's an Erard piano, uh, make much favoured by Chopin and Liszt. Believe it or not, Lady Eilif bought this for the princely sum of £10 in the 1950s. Of course, it's worth very much more now. Who, who's the chap in the photo, Nick? Ah, he's a nephew of Lady Eilif, another nephew of Lady Eilif's. He's Herbert Duplessis, a concert pianist. He lives in France, and he uh, concentrated very much on playing Chopin and Liszt. This was his speciality. The wall hangings, which are this um, red, crimson hangings, were actually hung by Lady Eilif. She was a very hands-on lady, and if she was going to do something, she tended to like to do it herself. So the story is that she would climb the ladder while her butler held the ladder steady for her. Oh. And so she was one who hung these, this dark red felt. They were chosen this colour because it's a very fine background to show off paintings. And incidentally, she was very hands-on, as I said. The carpet she actually scrubbed herself when it had been obtained in auction. Shall we go into the dining room? Oh, we definitely, yeah.
So here we are, Andy, in the dining room. Ah, oh, lovely. They've set the places for us already. <laughs> Excellent. Hang on a minute, Nick. This room seems a little bit familiar to me. Is there any reason why that might be? Well, it, if you saw the film Pride and Prejudice, starring Kira Knightley, this was the ballroom where Mr. Darcy had his first dance with Elizabeth Bennet. It looked quite large in the film, but now, as you see, it's been restored to its normal size. Indeed, it's been laid up for dinner. The dinner service is Chinese export armorial and dates from about 1765. It bears the arms of Francis Sykes before he was created a baronet in 1781 and was probably ordered before he left India. The crest bears the woman of Bengal holding a rose. It was acquired by the National Trust in 1987 thanks to generous donations from Zoral Eilif, the National Art Collections Fund and National Trust Associations. So much history in this room. Have you got any other little golden nuggets of facts for me? Well, yes, if I put my gloves on. Because I'd like to show you this pair of mahogany urns which came from Ham House in Richmond. They were made in 1775 for the 5th Earl of Dysart. And if we look inside, you will see that the butler would store his wines in this drawer down here. And above it, curiously, for the convenience of the guests, would be a chamber pot. The ceiling was designed by John Carr of York, who was the architect of this property, although it has been restored by Alec Cobb. To reflect Lord Eilif's interest in the arts, he was a member of the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre Trust. The far painting is of Thalia, representing comedy. In the middle, we have Melpomene, or tragedy, and you'll see that she has a sword pointing to a building in the, on the horizon, which happens to be Basildon House. And nearest here by the window is Orato, or poetry. This lovely chimney piece came from Panton Hall in Lincolnshire, another of Carr's properties. The original one is to be found at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York, where it is in a ballroom which the hotel have nicely titled the Basildon Room. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Well, let's go and see the library. Oh, yes. I suppose after a meal here, the ladies would retire to the withdrawing room and the gentlemen to the library, so it's fitting that we should go in this direction. OK. Ah, so this is the library. Lovely. My favourite room in the house, this one it's, is, It is one of mine as well, I must <laughs> say. Uh, it painted this dark colour, red, by Lady Eilif for two principal reasons. The first being that she thought this was very much a male preserve, and this dark red had a masculine effect upon it. The other reason, for a more practical one, is that it shows off paintings particularly well. And you see in this room, Lord Eilif had a nice collection of paintings, and two of the big uh, paintings that really caught my eye actually as we came in were these two big ones on the wall here. Any particular history with these? Well, these two, these two big ones are by Charles de la Fosse, painted in the late 1700s. They were given to the nation in lieu of tax. This one is entitled uh, Romaldo and Almeida, and the other one on the opposite side is of the Rape of Europa. Yeah, what I really like about this room is it's got a very lived-in, homely sort of feel. And that's a lovely portrait of Lord Eilif, isn't it?
Unlike other ceilings in the house, this one is plain, but originally it would have been a very elaborately plastered ceiling. In 1946, there was a fire in the room above which caused the original ceiling to collapse onto the floor beneath. The eyeless had it restored just to this very plain ceiling, but if one looks at the frieze, one will get some idea of how elaborate the plaster work was. When the ceiling collapsed, it caused burn marks on the floor, of which these are just a few examples in the room. So here we are in the crimson bedroom. The bed and the drapes, all crimson, that came from Ashburnham Place in Sussex. It was in 1954, when they were having a sale of the contents, that Lord and Lady Eilif bought this suite for as little as £150. <laughs> Mark you, it was 1954. The bed itself was made in 1829 by a royal bed maker, a George Morant, for a visit, we believe, by the Prince Regent to Ashburnham Place, where they actually slept in it, we're not too certain. But it does suit this room particularly well, because the staircase we've just come up was put in in 1813 because of a visit by the Prince Regent, who stayed here some four days. Whether he stayed in this room, again, we're not too certain, but it certainly is appropriate on this side of the house. Now, this wardrobe, or more accurately, tall boy, is the only piece of furniture that the Isles did not acquire. It came from Hewenden Manor near High Wycombe in 1979, where Benjamin Disraeli lived when he was Prime Minister. Before he became a politician, Benjamin Disraeli was noted as a writer of romantic novels. And he had another claim to fame, not so widely known. He was considered a connoisseur of the fairer sex. He loved women, particularly the wife of his great friend Sir Francis Sykes, the third baronet. Her name was Henrietta. And they embarked upon an affair here with the knowledge of a husband who didn't seem to mind. Possibly because he was having an affair himself with a Mrs. Bolton at the time. And anyway, provided with the right social class, and had the lady had had her children, and one was discreet, one could get away with all sorts of wickedness. So the affair between Benjamin Disraeli and Lady Henrietta went on for some two years between 1833 and 1836, while he was writing a novel entitled Henrietta Temple. It was a romance between Ferdinando and Henrietta, but in truth it was a chronicle of his affair with Lady Henrietta Sykes here in this house, oh, which came to an end, as I say, in 1836, because Lady Henrietta took rather a fancy to a portrait painter whose name was Daniel MacLeese, who'd been engaged to paint a husband's portrait. Now, in those days, painters were considered very working class, and it was not the done thing to have an affair outside your social class. But didn't, this didn't stop them, as Lady Henrietta was clearly of a very passionate nature. And they engaged upon a very steamy affair here in the house, which came to an abrupt end when they were discovered by Sir Francis in flagrante delecto. <laughs> and he was not best pleased. In fact, he was very angry. And he felt the world should know about his indiscretion. So, in hindsight, he did a very silly thing. He bought some advertising space in the national press in which he denounced his wife's adultery and disclaimed any responsibility for the debt she might have incurred. The result of this was that Lady Henrietta became a social pariah. Oh. Actually, it was very sad because they, it was a very um, nasty divorce involving children as well. Sure. But he didn't come off too well either because he was labelled a cad on the basis that gentlemen just don't do that sort of thing no matter <laughs> what the provocation. But Daniel MacLeese was a bit peeved as well, as he was sued by Francis Sykes for playing around with his wife, Lady Henrietta, <laughs> but he was rather more successful in getting his revenge. He was an illustrator to stories of a friend of his who at the time was writing a piece called Oliver Twist. It's Charles Dickens. Oh, wow. And if you remember the story, one of Fagin's um, gang, with the unsavory character who was unkind to his girlfriend, Nancy, who was modeled uh, after Sir Francis Sykes, and he was called Bill, Bill Sykes. Sykes of ah, course. And the clever thing is that the, uh, Charles Dickens changed the spelling from S-Y-K-E-S to S-I-K-E-S in order to avoid any possible litigation by means of libel that might have come his way. But you see, it was, worked very well because everybody read their stories and knew about the scandal and pointed the accusing finger at Francis Sykes and said, now we know how you treated your lady wife, Lady Henrietta. And that's the reason why this wardrobe was here in this house, because of that connection. I see, I see. <laughs> Ah. 
and this is the bamboo bedroom. It gets its name from the bed, which appears to be made from bamboo. Actually, it isn't. It's uh, mahogany, but it's been shaped to look like bamboo. And lovely drapes and everything around Tira. Who made these? Well, this is Lady Ilive's um, handiwork. She was a very clever needlewoman. She made the bedspread, she made the drapes around the bed here. Oh, also, she made the pelmets and the curtains for this room. Uh, Lovely. And um, I'm noticing these interesting characters on the bedside tables as well. Ah, Who are now these? These are rather fun characters. These are 18th century medicine dolls. Right. Lady Ilive found them in London in the 1950s. Uh, the story is that they'd be used by the aristocracy when they went to visit their doctor. They would never undress in front of their doctor. They'd either take a servant to do that for them, or they'd use a medicine doll, in which case they'd point at the part of the anatomy where they were hurting. Oh, right. And I'm assured there are correct in every anatomical particular, but I'm not going to show you now. If you I'd mind. rather you didn't. Thank you. Lovely looking things, though. Great fun. Before we leave, Andy, I really must show this lovely wardrobe. Mm. It is solid oak. It is French, from Brittany. We believe around 18th century. But the story behind it is that a tradition in well-to-do families, when their daughter was born into the family, they would hew down an oak tree, let it season over the next 21 years, and eventually fashion it into a piece of furniture, which would then be presented to the daughter, either on her coming of age or her wedding, whichever happened to be, happen first. Well, Andy, that was the bamboo bedroom, but now I want to show you something quite extraordinary. Extraordinary? Well, lead on. Oh, well, this was certainly not what I was expecting. The shell room? <laughs> yes. The collection of shells by the First Lady Eilif, whose portrait hangs on the wall over there. A somewhat retiring lady, I'm told. She accompanied her husband when he was doing business overseas, and rather than socialising, she went along collecting shells, and this is the result. Wow, an impressive collection. Certainly never seen a collection like this before. <laughs> Well, you weren't kidding, that really was quite an extraordinary room. This is a wonderful collection, isn't it? Yeah. Where to next? Well, why don't we go into the green shins bedroom? Oh, OK. So here we are, Andy, in the green chintz bedroom. Ah, and another room with lots of very large portraits, I can't help noticing. We could well actually call this room the Dillon Room, because everything in here has come from Ditchley Park, which was the home of the Dillon side of the family. For example, that gentleman there, that very portly gentleman, <laughs> is the 12th Viscount Dillon. If he really was that size, well, here's his bed that was made for him in 1790. And if I say if he really was that size, that'd probably be a single bed in mm. his okay. Very yes. interesting design, this bed. Doesn't look like an English design, does it? <laughs> well, it's an English make, made about 1790, but actually the design is Polish. Ah, right. The reason for that is at the end of the 18th century, when Louis XIV of France married Princess Leszczynski of Poland, there was a much craze in Europe for things Polish, in fashion, in clothing, and of course in furniture. And so that reflects that particular craze. Not my choice of bed, I have to be honest. <laughs> but some people like it. So let me show you this picture. This is a rather unusual one for this house. I'm sure it's her face that's familiar to you. Face is certainly familiar. Perhaps the lascivious look in the eye. <laughs> well, it's Charles II. And he's here because we believe that one of his mistresses, Barbara, Duchess of Cleveland, her granddaughter, married to Dylan. It's a very tenuous link, but I think it suits for this room. So over here, we have another portrait. 
This time it's of Augustus, the 13th Viscount Dillon. I see. And uh, interesting porcelain on the table just underneath him. Oh, that's Minton. That's late 19th century. It's lovely. So let's go and have a look at Lady Ilya's bedroom. Okay. So this is Lady Ilya's bedroom. A great favourite with the ladies who visit us here because perhaps it's the pink colour. It is a very light, attractive room. Lovely, lovely. And uh, especially like the alcove where the bed is in there. A unique feature of this room, I think. Makes a change from a four-poster bed, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Lovely. Did it always used to be a bedroom? Well, in the early days, of course, it was. But during the last war, it was an office administering the prisoner of war camp that was in the park. In 1952, when the Irish came to look at the properties, I said it was empty. But this is where the fire started. They couldn't actually get into the room. There was no floor. It was just charred rafters. Oh, dear. So they made a lovely job of it. Absolutely. And I noticed some very nice drapes again in this room. Another example of Lady Eilish's skill with the needle. Oh, right. She made the drapes and the pelmets that hang above. And she also made the bedspread, uh, which matches the curtains rather well. Oh, yes. Look at that. Now this chair is interesting. Oh, yes. Its regency was made by Royal Upholsterers Morell and Seddon for Princess Amelia, who was the daughter of George III. Oh, right. They're, in fact, one of a pair with the matching footstools. Mm. Ah, now I recognise that signature. Well, that is the Queen Mother. She paid us a visit here on June the 21st in 1982, and that's the second link this room has with royalty. Well, Andy, I think you've seen everything now, so why don't we go downstairs and have a nice cup of coffee? Oh, good idea. Lead the way. <laughs> Thank you.